Okay, and we are live. Hey, friends, welcome back to my channel. I have the distinct pleasure and honor this evening or morning for Juliet of introducing Juliet Marillier, who is somebody that I have, I'm so excited to get a chance to delve into your writing. Juliet, thank you so much for graciously spending your time with us. Well, thank you for having me. So for anybody in either the comments right now or anybody watching the replay later on, would you be willing to just give a little backstory about who you are and the books that you've written? You have over 25 books, which is incredible. Mm -hmm. So if you could give us a little bit of an intro to you as a writer, that would be awesome. Okay, well, I'm known as a writer of historical fantasy, which some of which is quite historical and some of which really is in invented or alternative history, mm -hmm. um, very often quite based on folklore, myths, legends, fairy tales, um, but generally not retellings of those, but my, you know, sure. my own story that has elements of one of those. Uh, born in New Zealand and had, that's where I had my education and uh, got married and where my first two children were born. Now a long-term resident of Australia. I live in Western Australia and um, have had a lot of changes in my life. Um, what else do we want to know? Um, <laughs> didn't really start writing for publication until well into my adult life, although I'd written a lot as a child. Um, and yeah, tried I tried out tried writing romance first. Uh, submitted a couple of manuscripts, got nice encouraging feedback, but not hadn't, you know, really quite got the, the product right for the publisher. Mm -hmm. um, and didn't have my first book published until I was in my 40s. And so, well, you know, quite uh, actually late, well, late, very late 40s, 50, 50, in fact, was the, um, the time when I got my first contract. So, um, yeah. A late bloomer, but not someone who started writing late because I'd always loved books and reading. And as I said, I had dabbled in writing prior to that. But um, I sometimes wonder about what would have happened if I'd started writing <laughs> for publication or trying to be published when I was 20 rather than in my 40s. Um, and I think that I wouldn't have written quite as well as I, you know, mm -hmm. I, have, I wouldn't have had the success I've had because I've got a lot of years of life experience in there and yeah. undergoing some fairly difficult situations in my life and that has definitely coloured the way I write. So since that first book was um, accepted by a mainstream publisher, I, as you say, I've done more than 25, most of them published by sort of Big Four or Big Five or whatever there are now of uh, international publishing houses some of them with smaller independent publishers, which has been mm -hmm. an interesting experience, and um, have a lot of readers all around the world. So even though I live in Australia and New Zealand is still home, um, I have a, a, a big readership in the USA mm -hmm. and I also have very keen readers in particular parts of the world like Portugal and Brazil. Really? In the past, the Netherlands and Germany, although not so much now. So... It's, it's been a, a very interesting life experience and I guess you can see that bookshelf in the corner behind me which has <laughs> some of the many editions of my books in English and in foreign languages and the other shelf which has a lot of books published by, by friends, writer friends. Oh, um, so, yes, it's a house. There's a bookshelf in every room of this house and not dogs in every room all the time but there are certainly dog beds in every room. <laughs> That's the other part of my life, apart from being a mother and a grandmother, and which is very important, probably the most important thing. Um, I'm also a, a dog rescuer, and so you'll always mm. see a few little waifs and strays. <laughs> oh, yeah, actually, Rocky at the moment is on the floor at my feet, pretending to be sort of half asleep. He has to, when I'm working in here, because I'm sitting at my work desk with a big computer, he always comes in and keeps me company down there. It's like he needs to know where I am all the time. So yeah. They're a big part of my life as well. So, so you're mm. so you're surrounded by family and pets and books, and that sounds awesome to me. <laughs> um, and, and also I live um, near, uh, within walking distance of the Swan River, which runs through the middle of the city of Perth, 
or runs through the city of Perth and a lot of beautiful old trees. I live in a suburb that has wonderful old eucalyptus trees that everybody mm. is very fond of and bushland and green. So I can just actually go out the door and in two minutes I can be down at the river and walking along oh, wow. the riverbank. So that's the other really important thing. Coming from a very beautiful part of New Zealand as I do, I need the outdoors and the trees mm -hmm. and the green and that works its way into my writing as well, particularly the series I'm writing at the moment, which we won't talk about till later, yeah. but it's an important factor, yeah. I do wanna pull, there's a couple of people in the comments that are very excited. New US reader of your stuff, Daughter of the Forest is my soul book. Um, Jenny Bates, I'm guessing somebody you might know, Rocky, I love you. Jenny Bates, yeah. <laughs> yes. And she's pointing out to, for readers that one of my dogs is named Bramble, which if you've read um, the Blackthorn and Grimm series, that's, she's named after a little dog called Bramble in that series. So, yeah, I'm very excited to read that one. I just got uh, Dreamer's Pool recently, so I'm really excited to dip into that. Carrie says hello to Juliet, my favorite author. So you mentioned growing up in New Zealand, and am I pronouncing it's Dunedin? Yes, that's right. Um, I looked up some pictures and I mean, I have a new destination goal now on my bucket list because what a beautiful area of New Zealand. So for you, what was it like growing up there and, and what part did that play into your foundations as a writer? Well, certainly that very beautiful landscape is part of it. Possibly I didn't appreciate it as much as I might have as a child. Um, Later on, when I was newly married, we lived in a little cottage overlooking Otago Harbour, and mm. so there was the water and there was the peninsula, which has a an albatross colony at the end and, you know, wonderful trees everywhere. So that was very beautiful. But I grew up somewhere closer to the, the town. Um, but I can remember, I mean, those were the days when children were not, were not so carefully guarded when they were <laughs> outside as, as they might be now, and... Um, my school was walking distance from home and then walking distance from school was a, something called the town belt which is a very unromantic name but it was a it's a beautiful broad stretch of forest and bushland that mm. goes right across the middle of the city and so fabulous wild place for children to play mm. and have adventures and use their imaginations and so we my, me and my friends I and my friends used to go up there and you know, we'd be we'd be in this. It's like you know, think about forest and the Lord of the Rings. It was it's yeah. like a wonderful place to play, and um, so that was a that that was something I guess we took for granted as children, and then sort of I realised as time passed how 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 lucky we were, how fortunate we were to have that, and that appreciation of the beauty of nature and trees in particular was mm -hmm. really important. But also the school that I went, primary school that I went to. We were in a, a class that was divided two, divided two years in one class and there weren't very many of us in the older group. And I think there were a lot of very smart kids in our little mm. group and the teacher often really didn't know what to do with us. We were, <laughs> you know, a bit hard. And so we, we got sent out to, you know, to often to write with our little books and our pencils and so forth in the park next door to the school. And that was sort of 11 or 12 of us. And we would write these little books in cut down exercise books and write stories and pass them around to each other and give e give each other scores of a b c and <laughs> it was a fabulous start to being a writer this is all sort of under the age of 12 um and i'm still in contact with some of those people who've all teammates who've all gone on to do very interesting things in their life um yeah anyway i'm off the track but that was no that you're was fine very, very important experience. Um, later on, interesting, family, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, my parents were an interesting combination of a woman who'd had a university education and come from a quite well-off family that ran a printing business, so there was a lot of books in her life, and a man who'd had to leave school early to support his, his mm -hmm. widowed mother and his brother, and... So I'd only had primary school education. Those two met in first year primary school and they ended up getting married, which was oh. you know, a very, very different pair. Um, yeah. Both really valued books and reading. And so there were always books in the house and 
I had stories told to me at bedtime. There was also music in the house because my mother was a piano teacher. And so that all contributed to my, my love of reading and my love of writing. Also, a wonderful library, public library in the town that we could walk to from home with a very dynamic children's librarian who pushed me out of my comfort zone, <laughs> which is, you know, a good thing. Um, that was also extremely valuable. Yeah. Of course, New Zealand has wonderful Maori mythology, mm -hmm. ancient stories that are, uh, relate to those beautiful physical settings. And also Dunedin is it's called Dunedin because it's Edinburgh, the old name for Edinburgh, and it's a, a city that was settled by people from Scotland mm -hmm. and has strong Scottish and Gaelic traditions. And that, for me, was always alongside the more ancient mythology of the country. And I have Scottish ancestry, so you see the Scottish and Irish thread. Yeah. Very important in, in what I ended up finally writing when I got down to writing book-length fiction. That's probably it, I think. Yeah. Well, it's it sounds like you had kind of your your first writers group essentially very very young, which is really cool. Absolutely. Yes. And yeah. you see, you know, a writers group that happened a whole lot later in my life and was also very influential. Yeah. 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 Kind of a, a bookends of either side. It um, is. It is. So with with obviously folk tales and and fairy tales have always kind of in that ancient mythology alongside you know your ancestry have always seemed to be especially from your author bio a, a really important part of your life so coming into it kind of late in terms of publishing but when did you know that you wanted to be a writer or or when um when did those kind of folk tales and fairy tales lead you to want to write your own and take it farther Interesting, because I wrote so much from the age of sort of old enough to, you know, do the pencil in the book through to mm -hmm. my mid-teens, including some quite long stories, not novel length, but, you know, the sort of thing you write when you're aiming towards that, was always a really avid reader and I've always loved reading mm -hmm. mythology and fairy tales and thinking about them and more more recently books about fairy tales and mythology mm -hmm. and how it works. Um but conscious decision to write for pub to try to write for publication didn't come till much later. It came to that, you know, when I was in my 40s and it related not to thinking, oh, I want to be a writer so much mm -hmm. as there'd been some really difficult stuff to deal with in my personal life and yeah. I needed to put myself together. And I actually partially put myself together by starting to write Daughter of the mm -hmm. Forest. Mm -hmm. Now I had done those sort of attempts to write romance before that so perhaps those attempts to write romance were me thinking I need a different career from at that stage the rather boring public service job that I was doing to support my family mm -hmm. um and then I you know tried to write the romance stories and uh, there was obviously the writing was okay but I needed to take another step but it mm -hmm. wasn't until I was doing it because I thought I really need to I really mm -hmm. want to write and that was when not thinking I want to write and get rich and famous because I didn't mm -hmm. think that um, mm -hmm. had had some common sense. But because <laughs> I wanted to put myself back together emotionally, I thought, right, I'm mm -hmm. going to write a story. So I, at that stage, I was um, it was just me and my youngest child um, because they were all the others were all doing other things. And um, yeah, why did I decide? I, I think I suppose I thought I thought you know the thought process without being very conscious was I love fairy tales. Mm -hmm. Some fairy tales are very emotionally powerful, like the Six Swans, which is the story mm -hmm. of the girl you know this one that Daughter of the Forest was based on. And um, I thought, what would happen if those traumatic effect, uh, events of that story happened to a real family? It mm -hmm. wouldn't be as simple as it is in the fairy tale. It would affect every individual of the family differently mm -hmm. and so the brain ticked over and thought how interesting it would be to write that story let's put a real family in the fairy tale yeah. and see what happens and knowing what happens in the fairy tale I thought right, I'd, I'd probably need to keep the framework of the fairy tale and have it end the same way but I'm going to be following what happens psychologically with all these different individuals how will it affect them what things are likely to happen to the young woman when she's alone mm -hmm. so long and unable to speak 
what might happen in her life. Um, mm. How will they all mend themselves? Perhaps some of them won't be able to mend themselves at the end. Perhaps some of them won't come out with their happy endings um, mm -hmm. stronger than others. So that, that probably not only started off that story, but also a lot of my other stories, which are about people who've either suffered trauma or depression mm -hmm. or difficult things in their lives, somehow managing to, to heal or to help mm -hmm. each other. So it's not in every single book, but it comes in quite a lot of, it comes into quite a lot of my stories. Yeah, a very common, and even from reading Daughter of the Forest, and I'm excited to keep going now, um, there's such a, an honesty about the way that you tell the emotional story of, this, of these characters that I really connected with right away. And it was just, it's such a beautifully written way of expressing those hard things and those hard experiences. Um, and I was just really blown away by that. And I want to ask you a little bit more about that later. But one of the questions yeah. that I just thought of was, you know, you mentioned the six swans leading kind of into an inspiration for Daughter of the Forest. Are there any other folklore fairy tales that have been particularly influential to you over the years? Well, I've I've built quite a few into my into my books. Um, so I guess those are the most influential mm -hmm. ones. Um, Wildwood Dancing, which is was my foray into writing for young adults, um, is obviously based on the Twelve Dancing Princesses. Although mm. writing a, a a book with convincing sort of real characters based on that required a, a <laughs> lot of changes to the fairy tale, um, but I had a I had fun writing that. It was a sort of an antidote to some of the uh, warrior woman stories sure. that, that, that were being published at the time. Although I've since done a warrior woman story, but hey, um, <laughs> yeah. so it's all it's all full of dancing and dresses and fun and magic, but it's got that sort of dark story mm -hmm. at the centre of it. So that's that one. Um, I've written a book called Heart's Blood, which is um, based on Beauty and the Beast. That's mm. this one. Very beautiful, very beautiful cover. That is a beautiful um, cover. Based on a, a classical painting. Um, and that's one that also deals with, with trauma. Um, and it's recognisable as Beauty and the Beast, but mm. it's very, very much changed with a lot of additional characters and so forth. So because, and also because sometimes a fairy tale, you know, it has, has beautiful um, elements that touch the heart and touch something deep inside, but also um, has, I guess, that the, the moral of the story often belongs to the period that it was originally, or right. that it was most commonly told in or thought up and might be completely not apt to today's reader. So mm -hmm. you've got to re reflect that when you when you write the story, I think, yeah. Um, yeah. Yes, and you'll find, you may find that when you're reading um, Dreamer's Pool, the first in the Black Throne and Grimm series, that it is actually very loosely based on a story called, oh God, The Goose Girl, yeah. Mm -hmm. the Goose Girl. Not a terribly well-known fairy tale, but a, a powerful one. Um, and the element that's based on The Goose Girl, ha Girl has to do with people changing, a group of people magic into chain, switching bodies. Mm. So... Um, that was hard to do, but yeah, yeah, uh, quite interesting. Yeah, it sounds like a, a fun challenge, though. <laughs> well, it was a challenge. It was, and yeah. so you know, when I go on about Blackthorn and Grimm and how I like it more than some of my other series, um, it really has to do with the, partly with the technical challenges of, of, of that challenge and the challenge of writing in a different format from sure. what I've done before. Yeah, so we talk about yeah. that stage. Yeah. So when you start a new, a brand new story, for you, what part of that comes first? Do you have kind of a, an inspiration in mind that you start with? Do you start with characters, plot? Do you have an idea of where it's going at the end? What does that process look like for you? Different with each book, I think. Mm. Um, I mean, once I've decided what I'm going to do, I do a lot of planning and a lot of research. Mm. Um, Often it's just an idea. Um, when I, long way back, after I'd written most of the Seven Waters books, um, I wrote a book called Wolfskin, which mm. may be out of print now and in, in it's not available in a print edition, but it's still around as a fabulous audio book. Mm. Um, and initially I was thinking, 
I want to write my, my next series, I want to make it as different from Daughter of the Forest and from of the Seven Waters series as possible. So no sort of romanticism and, and fairies and beautiful forests and so forth. Let's do something that's gritty. And so, mm -hmm. and I wasn't sure what it would be. And then I happened to be reading a book called The Art of Viking Warfare, which was, you know, just interest in history and so forth. And yeah. came across um, berserkers who are technically are these people who rip off their shirts and stand on the front of the longship and <laughs> live the battle with no fear at all, um, sworn God-sworn warriors and considered to be a bit crazy, and um, realised that at the time, you know, they didn't go a Viking and raiding all year round, only at the times when the sea was going to allow it to happen without, you know, smashing your ship. So two seasons a year. So what did they do in between? They went home and farmed or did whatever it was and the berserkers were part of the crew and mm -hmm. so they also went home and helped mum on the farm or whatever <laughs> and I thought ah this is my central character someone who can turn on the frenzy and and the, the the fighting and all of that and the focus and then he goes back and he's his mum's good son, you know, tilling the yeah. fields and helping look after the younger children and uh, how does he do it? Um, and so that gave me a central character and the story grew from there. So just from reading something in history, um, story idea could come from a fairy tale that I encounter that I haven't, or, you know, thinking of some combination of fairy tale or mythology and a, a real story because every time I write, I feel like the characters are, not fairy tale characters or mythological mm -hmm. characters. They're real people mm -hmm. with real human psychology and um, doubts and fears and perhaps um, prejudices and whatever. And this applies not only to our central characters but to our so-called baddies as well. Mm -hmm. um, so I've got, I've become, I think, better at writing villains since the start. Try very much now to make them three-dimensional characters mm -hmm. who have good reasons for doing bad things or for, for going off the beaten, you know, off the, the, the track of goodness. And um, that can be quite hard too. But, you know, I figure that however many books you've written, you're always learning something new about the craft of writing. You can always challenge yourself with whatever you write next. Um, Absolutely. And, you know, you can always, you can always get better. Mm. When you start working on, you know, you have your, your cast of characters, one of the things I noticed in Daughter of the Forest is the relationships between the characters and how they're all connected to each other. How do you begin to build those, those kind of nuanced relationships throughout your cast? Because that was one of the things that I just, you know, the relationships between Sorsha and her brothers, for example, in, in Daughter of the Forest are just so authentic and beautiful uh, to read. So I'm curious how you start building that cast and their relationship to each other. Yeah, it's really interesting because it's such an organic thing. It's hard to analyze mm -hmm. steps as to how it happens. I guess the key to doing that is observing people in, and interactions in real life because mm -hmm. where else are you going to get it from? Um, and trying to put yourself into your character's mind mm -hmm. so that you can be that person and think about how they're going to interact and how they're going to feel in certain situations. Um, yeah, and it's not just observing the people around, close around you in real life. It's looking at all kinds of people, trying to be attuned to different kinds of people, meeting meeting people going into different situations, you build up an awareness of what makes people tick. And once I'm actually writing the book, the characters do become real for me. And I, I guess I just sort of know, know intuitively how they'll respond to certain situations and to one another and what decisions they'll make. Often they'll make wrong decisions. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so... It becomes easy. One, the, the further you, you you go into writing the story, the easier it becomes to to make those to make those connections come real. You'll be very interested once you start reading Blackthorn and Grimm because it's very much like that. You know how people respond to one another, and because I moved from a single, I've got a you know first uh, the Seven Waters series. Each book has a a first person narrator 
mm -hmm. um, the same narrator for, or the same point of view character for the whole book. Um, in some of the other books later, I have several different main characters who get point of view scenes, and so you can see them through each other's eyes and whether they have secrets from one another and what they hold back and so forth. So that's been, for me, a, a more interesting way of writing. Yeah. Um, you had an interview that I watched on on YouTube with Tony Lantis, mm -hmm. and you talked about, I really loved that interview, um, and you talked a lot about writing trauma and, and hard life experiences through the lens of your characters. Do you find that fantasy kind of offers us a way to explore trauma in a, a safer way? And when you're writing those kind of experiences, what are some of the things that are important to keep in mind as a writer? I think it, I think fantasy does allow us to explore it in a, in a safer way. I know that, I mean, there are certain things in my own life that I would never write about. So there right. are certain things still that will be too hard to write about. Um, probably edged around them in some of the books. Mm -hmm. um, not that any of the characters is actually ever me, but mm -hmm. in some of the books, some of the characters come close in terms of just a sort of, ah, oh, great personal trauma. Um, mm -hmm. I do think going through the lens of fantasy makes it a little easier to approach and probably mm -hmm. a little easier for the reader mm -hmm. to read those scenes. Um, as for how to do it, well, that's very tricky because, you know, there is a, a, a traumatic scene in Daughter of the Forest, mm -hmm. um, which was the first book I wrote. And I'm interested now that the publishers let that stand the way it was. I think if I was going back to write that again, I probably would not make it quite so confronting. Mm -hmm. And I've had very interesting responses from different readers over the years, including some readers who've absolutely hated it and said, why did you put that in there? Mm -hmm. um, someone who read it when they were too young to read the book, mm -hmm. perhaps not realising that it's actually a fan an adult fantasy book, not a younger end of YA. So someone who was just absolutely shocked by it and sure. I had to write them a very nice email saying, so sorry, and it actually wasn't mm -hmm. intended your age group and you know but so that was awful I felt bad about that but on the other hand read that scene I've had people who've been through the same sort of experience say mm -hmm. it felt real mm -hmm. and I felt you know, good about good about that they, they felt good about the fact that it was approached with that it's real it's traumatic it's terrible terrifying so hard to know I put the scene in not but not not in order to you know to shock but because mm -hmm. I was thinking as I said earlier what might happen to this young woman um, if she has to live all alone without any protectors or community or support um, mm -hmm. in this out of the way place, what is quite likely to have happened to her. And that is why the scene was included the way it was. But I do think that for, you know, as if you were looking at sort of advice for writers on how to deal with that sort of thing, I guess you've got to think about what your readership, what readership you're aiming for. Um, mm -hmm. is, the, is the trauma essential to your story in my case I felt that it was for that yeah. characters for the future growth of all the cast of characters um and approach it with care back in the day when I wrote that book which is you know 20 something years ago there were no trigger warnings people didn't know mm -hmm. what trigger were. there were no there was very little online you know the internet was in its infancy mm -hmm. I can actually um you yeah, typing out my then husband's thesis by hand and you know, sort of no home computer and the computers at the university had those sort of punch cards that went mm -hmm. through long, you know, long, long ago <laughs> in days. Um, yeah, so, and the other thing with, if you're writing a story that does have sort of some sort of traumatic experience in it, um, once you've finished and once you've got it exactly the way you think you want it, get other people who would know to read mm -hmm. it for you and give you some advice on on how it's presented that's always useful mm -hmm. people you trust but people who um who are wise and who would know yeah mm -hmm. uh my friend casey is a big fan of of the book and she said i'm glad the scene was kept in it's hard but it says so much about so many things people perceptions and experiences 
No, thank you. Yeah. Thank you for that comment. That's, that's really good. Cool. Yeah. Teresa says, I think Juliet is a master at writing relationships. I agree. And I've only read one book so far. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'm really interested. Um, there's a couple of people that are big fans of Wolfskin here in the comments, and yeah. that is one that I'm very excited to check out after Blackthorn. One of those very large books where, back when I was allowed to write 220,000 word books <laughs> at a certain point, people said, no, it's got to be shorter because it won't fit on the, the stand at, you know, the supermarket or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. But wolf, yeah. Yeah, Wolfskin and, and Fox Mask, which is the sequel, uh, both they both work reasonably well as standalone, but Wolfskin mm. is better as a standalone. Um, yeah, both really huge books. Makes me wonder how on earth I managed to do it now. Um, <laughs> but I, I think Wolfskin needs to be the link that is because it's a big Viking saga. It's got, you know, yeah. not only the intense personal story, but it's got a lot of sort of sweeping action and um, spread across quite a, a wide geographical area and well-researched history. That was the other thing, having written the Seven Waters series, which did not have well-researched history because in those days I thought oh, I'm writing a book that's got sort of fairy tale elements and magic and stuff I never thought, and it also has to have accurate history. So it's set in a vague, a vague period of Irish history. And um, I've had so many, I had so many people pointing out, you know, what didn't work in the history, which I, I know. Uh, and so by the time I wrote Wolfskin, I knew to do very good research. And Wolfskin and, and is, is actually much more historical than a lot of my other books are. So mm. it does have the element of the berserker and the, the you know, the call of the God to, um, to fight with complete courage and, um, but less of the fantasy. No, it says actually has other, you know, mythical elements of folkloric elements, but less less so than my other books. Mm. Well, you mentioned reading the um, the kind of Viking history yeah, account. Viking history, yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, are there any other books that you've read either in the past or or recently that that have been really inspiring to you as a as a writer? Oh gosh, where do I start? Um, <laughs> that's a trick question. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, that is a trick question. Look, I've 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 read other people other people's fiction. Although I try very, I mean, I read a I read a lot. Let's face it, and oh, that was something I left out of the. We haven't done yet. When I do advice to writers, you know, yeah, yeah, not reading just within your own genre, but reading really, really widely, all sorts yeah. of things. So for me, it's you know includes journalism and sometimes poetry and Jenny Bates who made a lovely comment earlier about sending love to Bramble um, is a poet and mm -hmm. I've read a lot of her her beautiful poetry um, often based on nature and she lives amid wild nature with a lot of wonderful animal friends and so she's been influential mm -hmm. um, and I read literary fiction I read a lot of mysteries and historical fiction and currently anyone who follows me on uh, Booktopia will see that there's an awful lot of um, historical mysteries, a sort of mystery romance fiction, Regency mm -hmm. mysteries. Um, so I read outside my own genre when I read within my own sort of specific genre. I'm very careful and I don't tend to do that when I'm actually in the process of intensely writing because it's I feel like it's too easy to pick up either style mm. works or other things from other writers and not realising that you're doing it. And I don't like the idea of borrowing too much from other, you know, yeah. other fiction yeah. writers. But um, I've read I've read some great um, nature books like Robert McFarlane's books and Rain or Wind's books about um, dealing with a autobiographical, you know, autobiographical, mm -hmm. but about dealing with huge family tra trauma by casting away all the trappings, trappings of modern living mm -hmm. and actually putting on a backpack with her husband and going on this huge walk around the coast of Britain. And mm -hmm. that is psychologically very intense and also really beautiful in terms of the way it talks about the nature, the way they encounter nature on their trip. Uh, she... Mm -hmm. I felt they were so brave doing that, something that 
I don't have the courage to do, but I really salute them. And so her, her, yeah. if you people want to look for that, the first one is called The Salt Path by Rain or Wind. You'll find it fairly easily. Um, so, you know, not necessarily inspiring my writing, but inspiring me as a person, which yeah. helps, with, helps with the writing. Yeah. Yeah. I think that creative input is is so important for us as writers mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. Um, so when you when you take a fairy tale, something like Six Swans, and you're expanding it into a larger novel, what are the some of the things that you keep in mind in terms of how much of the fairy tale to bring in? How do you find that balance of this is my own world and my own characters versus the fairy existing fairy tale? Um, several things. I hope I can sort of keep my thoughts in order. First up is the one I mentioned, whereas the fairy tale will probably belong to a, depending on what it is, it may belong to a particular period in real history. So mm -hmm. when particularly the French court around about the 16th and the 17th century, there were a lot of fairy tales told, mm -hmm. mostly to young women in a very sort of um, part of part of the court. And um, Often they were told in order to try to impart some sort of moral lesson or behavioural lesson to the to the particular audience. And we get fairy tales like um, Beauty and the Beast and mm -hmm. um, Cinderella and a lot of the ones that we know quite well mm -hmm. from that period. And so they have moral lessons. And for women it might often be um, that you've got to protect your virtue and you've got mm -hmm. to be sort of obedient and lessons like that and for the young men it might be about restraint mm -hmm. um, and some of those lessons are, are not totally really applicable to mm -hmm. now particularly the ones about women sort of being quiet and obedient and mm -hmm. um, you know we've we've thank god moved past that era <laughs> so, you know you think about what think about what the what the original message of that fairy tale might have been of course mm -hmm prior to the French court, there might be old, old, early versions of the same story. And so we're mm -hmm. looking back, you know, to the Greeks and Romans and back further because fairy tales were originally stories told around the fire and mm -hmm. often they were you know, to keep to keep the tribe safe. There were stories about, you know, don't go into, the, if you went into the dark woods, you might encounter the monster or the dragon or whatever. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, cautionary tales, if you like. So I guess you've got to look at it and say what's going to work for today's readership and mm -hmm. also what do I want to, what do I want the message of this story to be? Is it going to be about suffering trauma and being brave? Is it going to be about helping someone who's in trouble? Is it about two two broken people helping each other to mend? Mm -hmm. That's going to be in it. Um, I like to keep the most sort of evocative trappings of the story. So with my with Heart's Blood, which is my Beauty, Beauty and the Beast story, I felt that getting into the Forbidden Garden, mm. a rose or a flower, was going to be part part of it. I did feel that the sort of somehow the beastly nature of the 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 main man in the story was going to be there. But in my version of it, he's not magic into a beast. He's actually someone who's had a stroke in childhood and mm. is paralysed down one side of his body. And while he's in a position of leadership, that um, disability has held him back in terms of mm -hmm. his being able to believe in himself as a reader. So that's what another story that's about people making their way out of, of, of trauma, if you like. Mm -hmm. um, and again, with the end of that story, whereas in the fairy tale of Beauty and the Beast, there's the magical person. He suddenly is not a beast, but he's he's not only handsome and wonderful, but he's also rich and, you know, he's a prince or whatever. That I felt was not the message I wanted to convey in my right. story. I've done something different with the ending as well. Yeah, that's exciting. I'm going to have to go get that one now. <laughs> you know, balance you balance the the beautiful sort of key magical wondrous elements of the fairy tale. Keep them in some way, but make the story real to mm -hmm. today's reader. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, think, I have a feeling I've only answered part of what that question was, so you might have to have another look. And oh, just because well, you kind of talked a little bit about like um, the balance between how much to bring in and how much to leave behind. In. Yeah, I guess you find that when you're actually writing the story, and if you're 
putting the story in a setting that is different from the fairy tale setting. And let's face it, fairy tales usually don't even have individual names for characters and places. It's just the girl, the ghost, the, the, the smith, whatever, the princess. Um, yeah. Your story is going to become more complex because you're dealing with real world or perhaps real, fully fleshed imaginary world in some cases. And your characters have, have lives that have to come in. It's not just the simplicity of the story. So... I guess every 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 writer is going to do that differently. That balance. Mm -hmm. I think for me, I'm light on with the magical elements, but they're there to remind us that we're in the framework of that storytelling, and within the within the story, I build a story that has to do with real life and real life mm -hmm. challenges and character complex characters and so forth. So it's, I'd say with me, the real life relatable part of it is much bigger than mm -hmm. the fairy tale elements, but mm -hmm. it really depends on how you do it. I mean, with wild world dancing, there's masses of fairy tale elements of going into another kingdom and dancing the night away and wearing out your shoes and so forth. <laughs> so even though those girls are real are real girls with relationships and so forth amongst themselves, there's more fairy tale. Perhaps mm -hmm. that's because that's a young adult novel mm -hmm. and the others are for older readers. Yeah. So, you, you know, you, you, you get that balance according to the story you the book you want to write and um, and the readership that you're aiming for, I guess. Mm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and, and you've said in, in our correspondence early on when I messaged you that you consider Blackthorn and Grimm to be your your best or your favorite work of among the ones that you've done. Mm, mm. So what what about that series brings it to the top of the list out of 25 <laughs> plus books? <laughs> um, Look, I, I usually love the characters in my stories. I love mm. those two characters, Blackthorn and Grimm, more than any of the other characters. Um, with with that series, I, I'd i finished up a lot of series that had relatively young protagonists who were in mm. the sort of late teens, 20s, maybe 30 age group. And um, there were a few older characters, but not many. And I thought, right, now I want to write. And also those characters were generally, you know, sort of physically attractive heroic, et cetera, even though they, in some cases they had to overcome terrible odds to find mm -hmm. their true selves. And I thought, no, it's time I wrote a, a grown-up book. I want to write about characters who have been battered about in their previous mm -hmm. lives and pre the, the pa previous parts of their lives have, have suffered a lot, have undergone so much trauma and difficulty that they're really quite unhappy or beaten down and they've mm -hmm. got a long way to go from we're going to start at the story where they're at the lowest and see how we go with helping them to to mend mm -hmm. and so and they're going to be older so they're not that much older because they're living in a, a time period where people didn't leave you lead hugely long lives mm -hmm. but um so we're sort of back in the medieval island mm -hmm. period um but both Blackthorn and Grimm, we meet when we meet them, they're locked up so, together somewhere horrible, and they have a a lot of. They not only have challenges to face once they finally get out into the outside world, but they have the internal challenges of their mm -hmm. hang-up. So they have kept each other a bit stronger because of being imprisoned in cells opposite each other, but they're both broken, mm -hmm. and the circumstances under under which they get out are are tricky because she only gets out because she's she makes a promise about how she's going to live her future life and that's where your not fairy tale but your, your otherworldly element comes mm -hmm. in and so they've got a long path to tread they felt absolutely real to me from right mm -hmm. from chapter one both of them as did the third character who gets point of view chapters who is who is a prince so we've got that bit of fairy tale coming in because that one has a fairy tale behind it as well the first book in the series um and i had a lot of fun writing it because it was structured differently from all my previous books in that not only do we have three characters who write chapters from first person in first person in turn so it's i um but juggling past tense and present tense so mm -hmm. both blackthorn and Orin, who's the prince character, write narrative in past tense. Grimm, who's a man who has no education, huge, very, mm -hmm. very low self-esteem <coughs> and tends to think in the moment, um, mm -hmm. writes in 
present tense. So you're always mm. within the story at every moment, first person, present tense. Um, so we get his what he thinks about. He's he's very protective towards Blackthorn, and you get that. But you also get the fact that he feels that he's worthless as a human mm. being. Um, she has made the promise, so she's bound by the promise. She has to keep going, but she also is is carrying a weight of terrible things. She's angry, and mm. you can feel that in her writing. Or in the prince, who's comfortably ensconced in his his own comfortable manor house and um, is awaiting the arrival of a a woman to her, with whom he's fallen in love on seeing her portrait, writes in the way a slightly spoiled prince might write, a sort of lit, flowing literary style using lots of long words and mm -hmm. um, sometimes a little bit sort of acerbic, you know, so he's got a completely contrasting voice. Um, and putting those three together um, with those very contrasting chapters was a lot of fun to write and also allowed me to get really deep into the into mm -hmm. character of all, all three of them. So um, mm -hmm. it was it was rewarding, fun to write, really made me want to, to write on. And mm -hmm. I felt when it was finished that I was just extremely pleased with with the way it turned out. And the series did win an award for uh, within Australia, an Aurealis Award for Best Fantasy Book Series. So Congratulations. Perhaps I was, <laughs> maybe I was justified, yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I know, do, go I ahead. I do something new with each series if I can now, whereas mm -hmm. in the past I've done a lot of the first person female narrator for the entire book. And mm -hmm. yeah, so I'm sort of moving into different things, yeah. Yeah. I, I know sometimes with writing it can be, kind of help keep the momentum going if you if you switch from one project to another or something like that. So in Blackthorn and Grimm, did you find that writing three such different voices throughout the story was, do you think that was part of what made it so fun and easy to, to kind of? I, th I think so. Yes, I think it yeah. did. I think it made me, it made me want to keep going. I enjoyed writing all three of them, even though well, I did. I didn't. I, I enjoyed writing all three of them because they were so different. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I, I think that you know it's not easy to do, and I think some people found probably find the switch from past tense to present tense difficult. Mm -hmm. And later on, when I wrote the Warrior Bard series, which is a much more recent one, I used present tense first person for the whole uh, series, and some people like that because it feels like it's moving quickly and some people absolutely hate it. So, you know, <laughs> the way it goes, yeah. Can't please everyone, right? <laughs> no, yeah. um, Carrie had a question for you. With that lighter touch of magic, do you think if you were debuting now, your books would be put into historical fantasy or magical realism or another subgenre in the current market? Good question. Um, yeah, it's interesting. Um, I, th I think they'd probably still be put into historical fantasy. Um, maybe the young adult series, A Wild Wood Dancing and its sequel, and the Shadow, perhaps also the Shadowfell series, those are my two for young adults, might be placed somewhere else. Perhaps they'd be put mm -hmm. in, you know, fairy tale fantasy. I don't think magic realism, um, mm -hmm. I don't think any of them fit in there. Uh, there may be some totally new subgenre that I don't know about. I only discovered about romanticy. You know, <laughs> I hate that title. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, so, no, my, There's so many of them now. Yeah, yeah, I bet there are heaps and heaps of subgenres. So someone would probably find the perfect little niche. But I don't think all of mine would necessarily fit into the same group. So um, mm -hmm. as I've said, you know, some of them are a whole lot more historical than others. Some of them, like Seven Waters, pretend to be historical but really aren't. Mm -hmm. um, and that based on, I mean, that was my my first novel that was really sort of honed for publication, even though I'd written complete romance stories before that never got published. Um, and probably based on, you know, when I was young, there were some really bad movies of sort of King Arthur and the Knights mm. and so forth. And at the time, you know, age 12 or 10 or whatever, I thought they were wonderful and absorbing <laughs> and had no clue about the, the the horribly flawed history that has King Arthur and his knights wearing plate armor and so forth. So I was in that, still in that kind of juvenile frame of mind, probably when I started reading, uh, writing the Seven Waters series and 
you know, now I think they probably can be called historical fantasy. Some mm. of them, yeah. Mm. Um, Vaughn had the comment, so many of Juliet's stories balance along the edge of real life and fairy or fae. Warrior Bards does this brilliantly. So underrated, a recent fave of mine. Hi, Vaughn. Nice to see you out there, even though I can't see you. <laughs> um, yeah, well, that, I'm, I'm still trying to do that, um, balance, balance real life. I, I feel as if the fairy world as of fairy tales and um, folklore and so forth while I don't go out and expect to find fairies at the bottom of the garden, I feel like it's still out there and living in a really beautiful place as I do. I feel it there when I'm out in, in wild nature. Um, and you can think of it as whatever you want, you know, but it's really easy. I mean, I, I've often been to a place called the Crum Estate in Northern Ireland, um, mm. Crum, C R O M, Crum Castle, um, where we've had some writers' retreats, and that is. A place where you just walk out and you feel mm. the magic all around you. you. Look up at the trees, and the trees look like people, you know, mm. dancing and talking to you. And you go down to the lake. I, mean, I went down to the lake, and the first time I was there, I was down at the lake and swans, white swans, mm. and I thought, right, like, that's a message from from somewhere else because that was obviously well after I'd written Daughter of the Forest, which has white swans here in australia we have black swans not white mm. swans different so i'm happy to feel that i can get that balance between you know the the uncanny the unreal the magical and real life and and a blend of the two together mm. Mm. so uh, of all of your work where where do you typically recommend that people start when they want to get into re if somebody is brand new to your work where should they start? I think as an adult reader, this one, mm -hmm. um, Heart's Blood, that is the uh, Australian cover. It'll have a different cover elsewhere or get it as a, an audio book or an e-book. Uh, that's the, the one that has elements of Beauty and the Beast, but it reads as a novel, again, like the rest, Reads is a novel about real people. Oh, it's got ghosts as well. That's a bonus. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's probably the only one that's got ghosts as well as other um, uncanny elements. And it's a standalone, so you don't have to, you know, trek through a series of how many. Mm -hmm. um, I, If it's a young adult, then definitely Wildwood Dancing is the one to start out on. Um, that's, that's just a two-book series, and they're both – adequate sort of they're not that the, the second book civilly secret is more of a companion volume than a sequel even though it has some of the same characters mm -hmm. um yeah if you want to read a series very hard i mean i suppose you can go back to daughter of the forest which was written a long time ago um lots of fairy tale elements um but you know be aware of the the traumatic scene of sexual violence which occurs in the book um yeah, I, I still think, you know, I'd say Heart's Blood because I think it's good to start with a standalone. It's quite mm -hmm. quite typical of, of, of what I write. And um, if you want something that's that's a bit gritty and challenging, then try the Blackthorn and Grimm series starting with Dreamer's Pool. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. a three-book three book series. And with the Blackthorn and Grimm series, you get a standalone story in each book. Mm -hmm. But you also get the overarching story of Blackthorn and Grimm themselves, which goes through all three books. And one of the lovely um, descriptions from a reader was, or from a, a reviewer was, that oh, it's Holmes and Watson in medieval Ireland. So I, re I, I loved that. So that's awesome. Part of the, what happens with Blackthorn and Grimm is that they they solve mysteries for other people. So yeah, that's one thing that uh, with all of the reading within the genre I've done mysteries within fantasy worlds is something I would love to see more of. Yes. So I yes. love that. Um, you mentioned also when we were chatting over email that you are making a shift away from some of the bigger mainstream publishing houses into some smaller independent publishing houses. So mm -hmm. where, how has that been going and what inspired that decision? Really interesting question. Mm -hmm. Um, I've, in the past, uh, I've had a book of short fiction published by a, a local Australian mm -hmm. publisher, um, which was good. And um, 
also Mother Thorn, which is a recent <coughs> recent publication, which is a book of, of retold fairy tales um, mm. or reworked fairy tales, and that's by that's also with a small local publisher, but it's available fairly widely. Excuse me. No, you're fine. Now the current move. Um, I've never before had novels published by a, a small independent publisher, but with this new series, which is a two book series, and I've finished the first book now, I've just actually sent the manuscript off to them yesterday, so it's very new. That'll be coming out in early 2025, and now I have to write book two, which is this year. Um, look, there's two things. One of them's a bit negative and one of them is positive. The negative one is that um, since Warrior Bards was published, which was my last mainstream published book um i think that tastes might have changed i'm not sure what it is but um my agent who's a top new york agent hasn't been very interested in or has hasn't believed in any of the proposals i've put before him for what i might want to write mm. next because normally i'll run something by him before i start writing and say you know this is the proposal here's the story this is who it's designed for um, and he will say, yes, great, I think I can sell this to the publishers, get writing sort of thing. Or he'll say, I don't think I can sell it. And I've had three I don't think I can sell it to three different mm. proposals I've offered um, and reached the point where I said, this is just feeling bad, it's getting me down, it's making me not right, so I'm just going to go do my own thing. And it happened that I'd been talking to someone I know well who has started up a new publishing house mm. locally called New Dawn. And um, they were, I had some discussions with them and we decided that we would go ahead and do a project together. Um, and while I know that this won't have quite the international reach that mm -hmm. it would be if it was, you know, published by one of the big publishing houses, I'm really happy with the way they've published published with this I like the quality of the books that they've published already mm. I like the fact that I can actually deal with them personally here in the same city mm -hmm. and they have a fantastically supportive and creative attitude so mm -hmm. um so I made the decide to decide to go with that sorry my voice is you're absolutely fine giving up okay so we're going to do this two book pro uh, project together and I I actually chatted to my publisher last night and said how much can I actually tell them about it because at the moment <laughs> we've released just about nothing um, and we'll be doing publicity later on in the year and um, then to say it comes out early next year, provided they like the manuscript, of course. Yeah. But there's going to be a lot of work. They'll be saying change this and change that and tweak this and, you know. Yeah. Um, so... I'm allowed to tell you that um, the title of the first book is The Amber Owl. Um, I was going to get my Amber Owl down off the shelf, but I better not leave the desk and do that. But The <laughs> Amber Owl is a little tiny amulet this big made of amber, which you can wear around your neck on a chain. And it's mm. quite key to the story. And Amber, uh, amber is key to the story. Um, the series is called Heartwood. That's all one word. And Heartwood is the name of a beautiful old forest um, in a, an imaginary country that is a little bit like somewhere like the Baltic area of the real world, but again, not based in real world geography or history, but right. bears a close resemblance to some elements of real geography and history, let's face it. Um, yeah. And the character names are all from that sort of region. And um, the big theme is a conservation theme because our central character is very attuned to the forest and um, is a, low, a bit of a loner. She's a bit of an mm. outsider in her community and she has a particular gift that relates to animals and mm. to the forest. And so this, the big story is really a story about preserving forest, preserving nature, understanding the magic of nature and mm. uh, how important it is, to, it is to make sure that it's kept and preserved mm. That has partly to do with my belonging to a Druid order, which we don't have time to talk about today, but <laughs> that's one of the values. Yeah. And, um, and about, you know, it's partly to do with the state of the world and what's mm -hmm. uppermost. We hope it's uppermost in a lot of people's minds, which mm -hmm. is the 
is global warming and the threat to the threat to nature and how we all have to be aware of that issue and do something about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so my somewhat um, socially awkward central character um, finds herself plunged into a, a, mm -hmm. a big, big story that where she has to um, she has to do a lot of things that are quite terrifying for her. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that sounds, and you said early 2025 is, is the release yeah, date for. Right now. That is an Australian release and okay. when all that comes out elsewhere will depend on how the publisher goes with getting um, sure. distribution in other countries. I think that um, I'm hoping that they'll do a good, a good job with that. They, they have some wonderful authors, including a couple have, who've, done their debut novels with New Dawn and have mm. more coming out. So um, it's very promising for the future. That's awesome. I, I love uh, hearing really well organized, those small, because it, like you've mm. noticed, it's it's really helpful, I think, for, for writers to have the right option for them as a, as a person, as a writer, to have yeah. those different yeah. options of what works best. Yeah, so I'm really yeah. happy for you. That's exciting. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so it's exciting for me too. Exciting, but also hard work, obviously. So I need of to course. Yeah, keep doing that. Anyway, that manuscript's finished. So not quite as huge as Wolfskin, but it's a little bit huger than the ones that I've been okay. writing very more recently. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of excited people about this in the comments. New series sounds wonderful. Yeah. Never matter with an NYC publishing thing. So I will always be interested in reading what comes from the mind and heart of Juliet Merlier. And Casey, that, yeah. <laughs> I'm squealing over this book's uh, description right now. Good. Squealing is good. <laughs> um, so you also teach workshops for writers in Australia. And would you be willing to share for any aspiring or current writers that are watching this, would you be willing to share some of the adv advice that you share in those workshops? Oh, that's the one that I wrote down. <laughs> notes for myself in case I said something stupid, but the notes, the notes are kind of, you know. Love it. My notes yeah. look like that too. <laughs> so, so, so organized, yeah. Um, well, one of them I think I've said already for writers starting out, which is read because you need to be a, a reader to become a writer. And I was lucky I got to do lots and lots of reading when I was little, mm -hmm. mainly because I didn't go out and do sports and stuff like that, you know. Had a few adventures, but... Yeah, um, read outside your genre as well as within your genre. Um, that's really important. And, you know, reading is, is reading what's going on in the world helps mm -hmm. you to pick up real life experience as well as going out and doing, doing stuff. Get out there and meet lots and lots of different kinds of people because that's where your characters come from, okay? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, writer's groups helps to be, to have a writer's group of some kind. Mm -hmm when you're actually doing the writing but be careful and choose you know choose carefully because if you're in a group with un people that are not compatible or with mm -hmm. people who don't know how to offer critique well in other words by letting you know what's working and by offering constructive criticism rather than saying that's rubbish you know mm -hmm. chuck it in or you know you did that wrong there's no wrong there's just getting mm -hmm. better you do um so a supportive writers group you might find that via a local library or your lo local council might have something going or you can find them online but look carefully at what mm -hmm. you, you know get recommendations people might like to look at the writer unboxed mm -hmm. website and facebook page a couple of people from that group are on here which is great hello mm -hmm. um writer unboxed is a blog about the craft and business of writing. It has lots of contributors. I am an occasional contributor these days. I think I'm down to quarterly contributions. Um, lots of wisdom there, and there's a related Facebook group. And if you want advice on things like checking out writers' groups or where to go for read, someone to read your book and offer critique and so forth, that's an excellent place mm -hmm. to go. So look, writerunboxed.com, I think it is. Mm -hmm. um, and... The other one, which is terribly boring for you guys, but there it is, is be prepared to work hard, okay? There's no instant fame and fortune. You're not going to 
scribble your first book in one single draft and put it out there and, you know, be, be J.K. Rowling or whoever. Um, be prepared to work at the craft. Be prepared to mm -hmm. revise and revise and revise again. When you're finished and you think it's perfect and you've been through it and checked everything, give it to other people to read. Even if you're not in a group, find someone who'll read it for you, someone who would know, like, I don't know, a librarian, a trusted mm -hmm. teacher. Um, I must admit here that my mother was the person who read my <laughs> early fiction that I wrote as a young person. And at that stage, she was just 100% encouraging and never critical. And that actually was absolutely what I needed at that time to keep on doing it. The kids at school who said, you know, C minus or whatever, that's okay. We all did that to each other from time to time. Um, okay, but, you know, with the writer starting out, you don't submit your work for publication or dive into self-publishing until what you've got is as good as you can possibly make it. Mm -hmm. So polish, polish, polish again and check it out. And remember it is it's hard work, but it's worth it at the end to do the, you know, to write the best book you can possibly write. And mm -hmm. Yeah, and keep on believing in yourself because if you're a storyteller, you're a storyteller and you're going to do it eventually. That's it. Yeah, I love all of that. I think the hard work aspect of it is something that a lot of people don't realize how hard it is to write a book. It is, yes. yeah, it takes a lot out of you as a, as a person to write it. Yes, yeah. and if it feels too easy, perhaps what you're writing is not not your best. Mm -hmm. Mind you, some people may be those remarkable and wonderful people that can just sit down and write the thing in a single draft and it's perfect. But I have yet to meet anyone who's actually managed to do that. It's generally hard work for everyone. <laughs> hard work, but overall enjoyable, I think. Mm, absolutely. But you're creating something on the page and it's that's got a magic of its own. Mm. Vaughn says, Juliet led me to Writer Unboxed over a decade ago, never looked back. It's been my writerly home base ever since. Um, yes. and, he is, and he is the writer of some wonderful books himself of a sort of epic fantasy kind. So look for those. I know. Um, so for anybody watching, just since we're talking about it, down in the description box below the video, there are links to Juliet's website where she has links to everything else you could possibly want that she's involved with. Um, so if you're looking for a quick way to get to Writer Unboxed, um, just go to her website and there's a lot of uh, great resources and stuff there as well. So the book's coming out. For, for people who want to kind of stay up to date with what's happening with your, your new series, do you know roughly like how many books in the series are you planning? Where should people, um, is there an email that they can sign up for to keep tabs on, on when that's coming out? Um, it's a two book series. Um, I'm getting on in years now. I don't want to commit myself to, you know, another mm -hmm. six books and be 80 something when I'm writing. Um, <laughs> book series and you'll definitely need to read both of them because mm. when you get to the end of the first one you're going to want to know what happened next I hope um, my website will be undergoing a complete revamp this year so at the moment it's a bit lacking in some features that you might want um, I do have a Facebook author page which has the unwieldy name of Juliet Marilia official fan page <laughs> um, and you can message me on that um, and I do tend to put my news up there um, quite quickly. There's a blog attached to my website, and I'll try to be a bit better about putting latest news up on that because at the moment I don't have a, a newsletter. Mm -hmm. um, when, the, when the website's re revamped, we'll have some more features on there. I'm on Instagram, so you can, you know, comment there, but I'm, I'm not on Instagram quite as much as some younger and more energetic authors are, but I shall try and keep something on there and keep news on there because I've seen from the response to my Instagram post about this session mm -hmm. that that's a very good way of contacting a lot of interested people quickly. Um, and on my website, there is an email address at which you can you can email me. So um, I'll respond to, to messages from there. Awesome. Well, Juliet, I want to thank you again so much for graciously spending your time with me this evening, this morning. <laughs> um, and I, I'm 
really, really excited to dive further into your work. And I will definitely be letting you know once I get to Blackthorn and Grimm, because I'm even more excited about it after our conversation now. <laughs> Thank you very much for the opportunity. If you're wondering what I was doing when I was looking there, I was looking at Rocky, who has mm -hmm. been lying at the on the floor next to my chair through the whole session. So <laughs> you definitely have to be rewarded with the somewhat late mid-morning snack, my time. Um, <laughs> yeah, but it's been wonderful to be here. Fabulous comments from people. I'm Thank you all for tuning in and listening. Um, and I hope that we'll um, in some way or other be in touch from now on. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you, chat, so much. For anybody watching the replay, thank you for checking out the video. Once again, go down in the description box and click the link to Juliet's website because all of her links and resources and information about all of her books are on there and you can spend some time wandering around and find your entry point if you haven't gotten into her work already. So I hope everyone has a fabulous evening or morning or afternoon, wherever in the world you are, and we will see you in the next video. Thank you, everybody. Bye, everyone.